All right. I appreciate all of y'all joining in on this series of videos that we've been doing. I've been trying to do one a week, and last week we focused on woody ornamentals. The week before that we focused on perennials. So those have all been saved and uploaded to our extension Facebook and YouTube page. So if you've got any questions about any of those videos, you can contact me back. This week I wanted to focus entirely on annuals for the garden. Now I tried to kind of hit more of the popular type annuals, and some of these may not be popular yet, but I think they're going to be popular in the coming year. So you'll see some of them at some of the trial gardens across our state. And I'm going to highlight those for just a couple of minutes if you'll, if you'll give me time to do that. The University of Tennessee is blessed with three gardens throughout the state, one in Knoxville, one in Jackson, and one in Crossville. And they have different trial programs at each one of them, and they each kind of focus on different things. And what's great is they actually put their trial data on the UT Gardens website. So you can go on here on the website and look up their trial data. So if you're wanting to try out new annuals for your garden and you wanted to try out some new million bells, which are caliber coa, you can go on there and see which caliber coa kind of excelled in their trials over the past couple of years. It's always good to go back and look at this trial data because Unless you want to treat your garden as a trial garden, go buy something that's been proven to grow well in Tennessee as opposed to something that you're going to try and you know, possibly not grow as well in Tennessee. So let somebody else kill it before you kill it in your garden a couple of times. So this is I wanted to show you this website so you can go on there and actually look at some of these things. So this was just kind of an example that was prepared by Jason Reeves and Carson Brown. So this was just one of those sheets from last year but they have pages and pages from the past few years. So you can go on through and see how they looked each month of the year. And I like that. So I'm going to take, for example, begonia whopper red with bronze leaf improved. Basically you can look at it from June, July, August, September, and just look how it did each month because we know some annuals that we're, that we're going to talk about today. They look amazing in April, May, June, but once it gets hot, in July, August, September, they kind of fizzle out and they can actually die, but some of them come back whenever it gets a little bit cooler in the fall time. This is a good way to see actually which ones look good throughout the entire growing season. So go online, look at the 29, uh, 2019 excuse me, trial data for all the annuals, and you can go on, on there also and look up some of their plant picks that they call them. I'm just going to kind of jump in through some of the basic terminology that we're going to go through today. Now, annuals, the basic definition of an annual, it completes its life cycle in one growing season. And I wanted to show you this example, and I get frustrated sometimes. Like, we see cool season annuals and we see warm season annuals. Cool season annuals would be ones that prefer to be a little bit cooler. And the number one cool season annual that we see promoted is, is pansies. And I'll see some gardeners sometimes, they'll say, well, these are winter pansies or these are summer pansies. There's really no distinguishing characteristics between those. They're all in the family viola. Most of those prefer cooler seasons. So if you see a summer pansy, that's kind of an oxymoron. And, and kind of on another term, I get frustrated when people say, well, you're just a pansy. Pansies out of all the annuals that we're going to talk about today are the strongest one that I can think of. They bloom even with snow on them. So if you really want to be offensive to somebody, I think you need to call them a fuchsia or a marigold or something like that because I, I think that's going to kind of start that. Don't use pansy in a derogatory term. It's a strong flower. And why do we use annuals? Because if we're trying to find curb appeal and we're trying to find color throughout the entire growing season annuals fit the bill now there are some perennials that pretty much bloom off and on all summer but if we're trying to find something that's going to bloom basically from the day we plant it until frost hits it annuals will be able to fill that gap and i don't think you can actually get color and masses in some of the perennials that i talked about a couple of weeks ago because they bloom for a few weeks they may bloom for a month most of the ones that i talked about but they're not going to look good pretty much all summer long like most of the annuals that we're going to discuss today. So we use annuals in masses for curb appeal and color. Kind of highlighting this a little bit more. So most of the pictures, I've got to give credit where credit's due. Jason Reeves was able to send me some pictures of some of their favorite annuals that they've been growing over the years in Jackson. Uh, and most of the pictures that I've got are from the gardens in Jackson and some from the gardens in Crossville, and some from my own gardens and some from the gardens in Knoxville. So I kind of show you some of the ones that we like. So I broke this up 
into categories. So I kind of started off with begonia and I kind of went down all the way to zinnia. Now I did not cover every annual. So most of the annuals in this picture I covered today. Like you can see right here, zinnias, petunias, there's some vinca, there's marigolds. Uh, and I'm gonna cover most of the basic ones there's at the very end when we kind of open it up for discussion. If there's something that you feel really strongly and passionate about, I'll cut the recorder off and then we'll, we'll talk about some of those things and some of our, our favorite varieties for a few minutes. But I wanted to show you, this is why we use annuals in the landscape. For curb appeal, we want it to be these plants that we call look at me plants. I want to be able to walk by a landscape and I wanted to see something. I want something to draw my eye into it. So whenever I walk by a landscape, I want a plant that says just look at me. And that's, that's why I think we use annuals in the landscape. We also use annuals in containers. Now my mother, for quite a few years, I would buy her a different container for Mother's Day or for Valentine's Day in some cases. And my mother each year makes the best containers around her house. So my mother uses a lot of annuals around the house. So some of the pictures that I've got are, are from specific annuals that she uses in some of her containers. So when we're actually deciding which annuals to put in our landscape beds or in our mixed containers, we need to determine whether it's sun, shade, part sun, part shade. If the tag says full sun, it needs to be in six or more hours of direct sunlight. Now that doesn't mean it won't grow in less than six hours. That means it will perform its best in full sun. So like for example, million bells, in order to really get the full effects of all of their color and all of their blooms to maximize those blooms, we need to have full sun. Now these containers on my mother's, you can kind of see there's most of the plants in here are full sun type plants. They get sun basically from the morning time up until about one or two o'clock where she has these on her porch and, and they just do fantastic. And people usually stop on her little gravel road and ask her about some of her plants because they want to know some of the specifics about some of them. And sometimes it may take some trial just to figure out what grows best in our gardens. And you know, all gardeners, we're going to kill some things. And if everything grew that we planted, we would uh, we would be ecstatic. But that's not always the case for gardeners. We're going to make some mistakes. We're going to learn some lessons from gardening. To kind of jump on in here, I'm going to start talking about some, and I've tried to do this by alphabetical order, and I probably screwed up a couple in the middle, but begonias. We see begonias as probably one of the most commonly used landscape plants, and sometimes we don't see them used in the best situations. So I see some of the begonias, most of the begonias prefer to be in shade, but I see sometimes some of the landscapers around town put them in full sun, hot parking lots around concrete, and they sit there and they don't really grow. They have burnt edges around the leaf, and they don't necessarily look the best, but they always put begonias there. If we use the right begonia for the right spot, it will perform its best. Now, some begonias can handle more sun. Most of the begonias, for the most part, can handle part sun to shade. They range in sizes and colors, and the green leaf cultivars can handle a little bit more sun. And kind of talking about some of the ones that are popular, I think in this picture right here, this was the big series. Now, the big series of begonias has bigger leaves, bigger flowers, and overall the structure of the plant is bigger. The most popular begonia that we see that I love, that my mother loves so much, is the dragon wings. And that plant, even though it's been around for probably 40 years, I still think it's one of the best begonias. Now, I'm talking about the annual begonias right now. I know we can go into Riger begonias. We can go into some of the Rex begonias. There are a ton of different species of begonias, but we're mostly talking about the bedding type begonias today. And you can also see I put cocktails down. You know, we'll, you go to some garden centers or some box stores and you'll see them whiskey, vodka, rum, gin, brandy. I'm sure I'm missing a couple of them, but they all had these alcoholic type derived names of these begonias. So it kind of makes you wonder about the person who named them, what was their pastime or what was their hobbies in life. But we just call them the cocktails and there were cocktail mixes and things like that. But begonias, they are kind of a good staple plan. Some of the newer ones, the megawatts and the big series also perform well in the beds. Make sure you give them plenty of space. Calibracoa, if you were to look at it and you've never really seen it before, you would think it looks like a miniature petunia. 
This is one of the plants that does best in full sun to part shade. If they can get six, seven, eight hours or more of sun, they will develop those blooms and actually do their best. They have a trailing type habit, and I think they do best in containers. And my mother puts a lot in mixed containers, but we've also seen them in in some landscape beds and they also do well also, but just kind of keep in mind if you're putting them in landscape beds, they need to be toward the front. They don't need to be toward the back because if they're toward the back, they're gonna probably get shaded out by other things and you, you won't be able to see them. This would look fine around some borders of some of your landscape beds. A couple of the series that, that do really well in Tennessee, Super Bells, Mini Famous, Noah, and there are a ton of different types of uh, caliber koa. I remember we used to grow one at home that was called Vampire, and it was the brightest red. And I think this one in this picture right here that I took was a Super Bells. This is one that I'm going to be planting here at my house. I, I took this picture on a, on a little basket that we had that I plan on putting it somewhere else in a, in a landscape bed because I really like this plant. Out of all the plants I'm going to cover today, I think Coleus is probably my favorite one. Coleus, a lot of the older ones, we kind of knew them as being shade plants. A lot of the older coleus was also seed grown. They weren't really vegetatively propagated by cuttings. A lot of the newer coleus, they're known as sun coleus. They can handle sun pretty much all day long as long as they're watered. Coleus can be used as a bedding type plant, mixed containers. We have some varieties of coleus that are trailing now and they do fine in hanging baskets. There are literally hundreds of colors available on these coleus and I get so frustrated at these plant taxonomists because they change the name of all these things so growing up coleus was the Latin name for coleus and it was called coleus blumii and then a few years ago they changed it to Solanus demon scutellarioides they changed the Latin name and then they changed it again a couple of years ago to plectranthus scutellarioides if these plant taxonomists would just leave it alone we would know the plant by by, the, by its name coleus there was even an encyclopedia written about coleus and then it kind of goes through some of the struggles because regional names can also dictate what some of them are called so you can see a beautiful red variegated coleus in one part of the country and it's called British red coat and you can go to another part of the country and it's called fireball and you could go to another part of the country and it's called something completely different so they can each have their own different names in different parts of the country but you can find all sorts of coleus on different types of websites and there are a lot of newer cultivars that are patented so really you can't vegetatively propagate them and and sell them Pinch off the blooms as they develop so that you can start getting some more of those new new leaves coming up. And some of the cultivars that are just commonly used, the Wizard Series is an older seed-grown series. And you can hopefully see most of my screen, my bars kind of up a little bit. Alabama Sunset, which is the one pictured right there, I think if there was an Olympics, Alabama Sunset would be a gold medal winner every year. I really like that coleus, and it's been one of my favorites for probably 10 or 12 years now. In the beds, also using it in mixed containers. Fishnet stocking is kind of a, a dark green one with, with black venation on it. Fireball, and also hopefully you can see it, Kong is a seed-grown variety, and it's a shade one, but it has really large leaves. So Kong came out Oh, probably in the early 2000s and I remember it kind of made a big splash whenever it came out as a large leaf variety of coleus. We're seeing coleus used, a lot of the newer ones, in full sun situations in landscapes. So keep that in mind. The tag should be able to tell you if this is more of a sun type tolerant coleus or a shade type coleus. And now I included caladiums because I love caladiums. But they're a tuber, but I consider them an annual. They don't come back in Tennessee, so if you want to keep your caladiums from each year, they need to be lifted up. They prefer shade, but when you look at the, the variety of all the different caladiums out there, you can have all kinds of different color in the shade. Now, this is in a mixed container. They're great for shady containers, and that's containers that have been in trouble with the law. Then there are tons of cultivars available, and I wanted to show you one other, just caladiums. My mother always has a shade pot under her porch of a, just different colors of caladiums. This is at my friend Helen's house in Jackson. Cufea. There's three main species of Cufea that we see used in annual beds. Cigar plant, which is pictured here, Mexican heather, and then we also see one called bat face. 
they're pretty much, for the most part, full sun to part shade. And if you're trying to find a plant to draw in pollinators, I would consider these plants pollinator magnets, especially this one right here picture. This is called vermilionaire cufea, or we call it cigar plant. You could probably see why it's called cigar plant. The small blooms look like a little lit cigar. And we know hummingbirds always prefer plants that kind of have a tubular shaped bloom. This is a way to help draw those things in. And now vermilionaire, and I know it's one of the top plant picks always in the UT Gardens in Jackson. Outstanding annual for the landscape. Gomfrena, the one picture here is called truffula. This is pretty much a full sun to part shade plant. Now when I grew up, the Gomfrena really wasn't a great plant. I remember a series called Buddy. It was called Buddy Purple, Buddy Pink, Buddy White. They stayed small. They never really grew that well. A lot of the newer Gomfrenas can get up to three feet tall, and they're a great cut flower. We see in series like the Truffula, the Gnomes, which stay a little bit shorter, the Fireworks. Uh, there's a strawberry one out that's kind of red, but you talk about making a great plant for the background of some type of a border. Up to three feet tall, blooms all summer long. I wanted to include this because out of all the annuals, I think this plant smells the best. This is heliotrope. You know, helio means is Greek for sun, full sun. And the reason why I really like this plant, it's a bedding plant, is the smell. It smells amazing. And every time I smell different cultivars, I think they all smell like baby powder to me. So I feel like it's such a clean smelling flower. It just reminds me of fresh, freshly washed clothes coming out of the dryer and, or baby powder. And if you've, if you've ever smelled heliotrope, I've heard people say, well, it smells like vanilla. I think it smells like baby powder, but I'm not going to argue with you because your nasal, sensitive, nasal sensitivities may be a little bit stronger than mine. Now, impatiens are also an extremely popular annual. We see them in mixed containers, hanging baskets, and as bedding. They do have some issues coming down the pipeline that have been here for a few years. Downy mildew. A lot of the older bedding impatiens will kind of, all their leaves will defoliate and the plant will slowly die by the end of summer, even though they still may have two or three months of growing left in the season. Downy mildew really will knock out a bed of impatiens, especially if it's a uh, been there before. So we're always recommended on impatience to select those that are downy mildew resistant, such as the New Guineas and the Beacons. Now that's two different types. Now New Guineas uh, are an impatient, but there are different species of impatience. So they don't look the same as the regular bedding impatience that we grew up, maybe calling sultanas. I had an aunt, that's what she always called impatience. They were sultanas. So kind of keep that in mind. And we have some that that can handle more sun, such as the sun patience, which is a, a new giddy type. And the shade are mostly the bedding type and part sun, part shade, the new guineas can handle a little bit of sun, a little bit of shade. A Couple of other series that you may check out if you really like impatience, bounce in the divine series. Here, were, here they were again in, in, a, in a part sun, part shade bed over in Jackson. Out of all the annuals that we're going to discuss today, there, there are two of them that I really like. I love coleus, but I really love lantana. And it's a woody annual for the most part in Tennessee. Now, if you go to Florida, this is pretty much considered a weed. And when you tell people from Florida, I love lantana, they curse you, they cut your tires, they don't care for it. Sometimes this plant is perennial. There's a couple that can come back in Tennessee. Now, that's all indicative of the weather in the wintertime. Um, Mrs. Huff was one that has been known to come back sometimes. There's, there are a couple other cultivars. I do like some of the newer ones. I like the Lucky series. I like the Luscious series. I bought some bandana here recently to put in front of my barn because I like the way they are, the Patriot series. What's great about them, and I think out of all the plants we're going to discuss today, if you can't grow lantana, you shouldn't be gardening to begin with. It's extremely drought tolerant. This is one of those plants that you set it and forget it. Maybe y'all remember that little oven that was on these infomercials that come on at two o'clock in the morning, Ronco, you set it and forget it. I think lantana are one of those plants. You may have to water it a little bit to get to established, but in the long run, it's probably the most drought tolerant out of all the ones we're gonna discuss today. Showing you some more lantana in the landscape. They really do bloom well. Um, they're great for attracting butterflies to the landscape. 
Marigolds, we have two main branches of marigolds, the African and the French types. Now, there are different colors in each one. Some of them can be white, yellow, orange, and they're all kind of those types of hues. For the most part, they are full sun to part shade. They're extremely drought tolerant. There are some great series out there. Big Doug, Bonanza, Janie, Taishan, Inca series. Some of these series like the Janie, Bonanza, and Inca have been around for a number of years. What's great about marigolds, they're pretty easily grown from seed at your house or you can go buy transplants. Now, some of uh, some of the ones, you, it may be later this year, if you try to buy seeds right now and try to get them started, they may just come on a little bit later. But marigolds start easily from seeds. They transplant easily. So you may keep that in mind next year. If you want to try some of these newer series of some of these, excuse me, marigolds, you may buy a couple of packs of Big Duck or Taishan. <clears throat> petunias is probably the most popular annual out of all the ones we'll discuss because it's the ones that we see in hanging baskets is the ones that we see in most bank parking lots we see it in gas station parking lots i see it at walmart parking lots it's a full sun plant the only issue is blooming can slow down during the heat of summer so sometimes this plant will need help it may need to be cut back sometimes. So petunias, if you had a, a 10 inch hanging basket of petunias, by the end of July, they can really look ratty. And I know this is awful. It's best to go through and just cut that thing back, hit it with a dilute fertilizer, and actually flush that thing back out. So by the end of September, October, it'll kind of look fantastic again. Now that's a burgundy star wave in that picture. For the most part, the most, the most widely known series right now is Wave. It's been out for a number of years. Tidal Wave was kind of an offset of that. Then you had Shock Wave. Then you had Easy Wave. Supertunia, Su Vista Supertunia Bubblegum has, is extremely popular. You have some that are more of the bedding type petunias that don't trail. A lot of the newer ones trail. So if you buy them uh, and they say wave on the package somewhere, easy wave, tidal wave, shock wave, that's going to be one that can run two, three feet, depending on how big it is. I enjoy the tidal waves. I remember planting some tidal waves in some beds in Rockwood, and I'm talking three, four feet wide. They can get a couple of feet tall, and they do bloom most of the summer, but kind of keep in mind in July, they can really take a beating, but they usually flush back out toward the end of summer. We do see some of the newer petunias that are black. We see some of the new ones. It's like I think that one was called Starry Night that looked like someone took bleach and just splashed it on top of the flower. My mother used to put these in her mixed containers. Uh, I planted a couple of different ones at the house here, and they do kind of go through cycles. So they bloom really heavily for a while, and then toward the end of summer, they kind of look ratty, but they'll usually come back. Here's was uh, I believe these were some of the super vistas in some of the beds in Jackson. You can kind of see they are really a knockout plant. And if you're looking for giant pillows in the landscape of color, and we talked about at the beginning, we want curb appeal. We want our eyes to be drawn to some of these beds, and these super vistas will, will really help out. And you can see the background right there, all the coleus that are used in the bedding type sense. They need to be used toward the back because some of them can get three or four feet tall to begin with. But keep in mind, some of those coleus do need supplemental watering if it gets that hot. Portulaca, a.k.a. rose moss, moss rose, uh, whatever you want to call it. Purslane was another name I've heard it called. Full sun, they typically have a trailing habit. Now, this one pictured here is part of the Mojave series or other series that are popular, Happy Trails, Happy Hour. These are extremely drought tolerant, so you may see them in the, in the garden center of the nursery, and it looks kind of succulenty. It has that succulent type growth. It has kind of a a fleshy looking leaf has a fleshy looking type stem. They do fantastic in Tennessee. And you'll kind of notice they need full sun to really bloom right. If they get a lot of shade, the flowers stay closed. If they get a lot of sun, it's kind of weird. When the sun stays open way too long on them, they'll close up the fl those flowers, but they'll open back up in the evenings. I've seen some of the white ones that were some of the larger flowering white varieties of Portulaca, and the blooms were so large they had a yellow center on top of the flower in some of the bedding type situations. They look like eggs scrambling in a pan, just the way the, the petals kind of fluttered through the wind. Salvia, 
Another great plant, now there are so many different species of salvias, you can get into oh, 30 different species of salvias. Some of them are extremely hardy in Tennessee, meaning they are perennial in Tennessee. A lot of the ones that I'm gonna be talking about um, are, are the annual type varieties, Bonfire series, the Vista series. I can't remember what this one was, but hopefully Jason will remind us that in just a few minutes. They're great for a pollinator magnet, full sun to part shade. And I kind of mentioned some are half hardy. It kind of depends on the series that you're going to get. Some of the more popular ones, I planted bonfire in front of my house last week, and it's kind of the older series, red flower. And you'll see some series called the Vista series. It's like red, purple, white. Um, and there are some that are kind of half colors in some of those. Scavola, also known as fan flower, has a trailing type habit, kind of like the million bells. It, it kind of grows down. Full Sun to Part Shade, two series that do really well, New Wonder and Whirlwind series. And this may be a plant that you're not really familiar with, but Scavola had been around for a while, and I don't know why they haven't picked on, but look at that, that mixed container right there. We want something like that in a mixed container to bloom as a knockout plant pretty much all summer long and, and do well in full sun. So people always think petunias and million bells, we need to kind of give Scavola a chance also. It also does well in the landscape beds. It kind of gives that pillow effect, a pillow of solid colors of pink, uh, shades of pink, purple, and white. Now, sunflowers, there are so many cultivars out now, and there are some varieties of sunflowers that are perennial. The ones that I'm going to be discussing are annual, so a lot of the ones are directly sown by seeds into the ground or you can purchase plants. Now, Jason's got, I'm gonna show you a picture in just a second. There are some newer ones that really heavily bloom great called Sun Credible. My wife, for a couple of years when we lived in Rutherford County, we had a long driveway and she always lined the driveway with a series, I think it was called Pro Cut. And it was mainly one of the series that people use for cut flowers. So it would have five or six different flowers on the branches. So if you get a chance, look up the Pro Cut series of sunflowers. Full sun, you can get the large-headed cultivars. You know, at our county fair, David Greer, we have a great vegetable show, and we have the largest sunflower contest. And it's unreal how large some people get these sunflowers. And I'm sure David will talk about that when we open it up. It's kind of crazy how big we get on some of these sunflower cultivars. Now, you will have to purchase plants on some of the ones that are patented or some of the newer ones. On the right is Carson Brown. She's a professional plant model from UT Gardens in Jackson. She works through with Jason. That is Sun Credible, and Jason really raved on that this past year. And the picture on the left was my driveway a few years ago, just kind of lined with all the sunflowers. Now, if you have issues with wildlife eating the sunflowers, it's kind of hard to direct sow them. You may need to start them inside and then move them outside once they've kind of got some legs beneath them. At my house, we have some issues with turkeys, and we've thought about planting sunflowers up and down the driveway, and I really think if I direct sown sunflowers, the turkeys would come in and eat them all the next day. <laughs> sweet potato vine. I love sweet potato vine. The ones I planted in front of my house this year were the Sweet Caroline series. This is a great ornamental plant if you're trying to fill in a big area with different colors. You can kind of see in this picture right here, kind of that chartreuse green foliage against that black foliage looks fantastic. Full sun to part shade. A lot of the older cultivars really heavily trail, and I put them at the bottom down there, Marguerite Blacky Tricolor. They will run and run and run, and you may regret planting them in a smaller area. A lot of the newer cultivars stay more compact, and they still have that great color of the leaf. They, they do run some, but they're not going to run as much as the older cultivars. And it's interesting. I saw a, a news article here recently that LSU, the Ag Center, is going to release an ornamental sweet potato vine that also produces an edible fruit. So I think we'll see that in the next couple of years coming out because these sweet potato vines that are ornamental – We'll, we'll actually make a sweet potato, but it's not really edible. It's really starchy, but it can get the size of a basketball because we used to plant these when I taught high school, and we would go clean up the beds, and we would bring these back to the classroom. And it was unreal how large some of these tubers would get on these ornamental sweet potato vines. Vinca is kind of a misnomer because this is in the plant family called Cataranthus. So sometimes we think of Vinca, we think of Vinca vine, Vinca major, Vinca uh, minor, which can take over a bed. 
and you can regret planning later down the road. Now, this is completely different and not in the same family at all. This type of vinca is full sun to part shade, very drought tolerant. This is a bed that I like to use. This is a plant I like to use in masses and beds. Now, this one pictured here is part of the Valiant series. One of my mother's favorites is the Mediterranean series because it's a trailing type vinca. And if you're trying to find some spots in the bed, if you've got rocks or if you've got some type of a spillway in your landscape beds, Mediterranean spill over well. A couple of other cultivars that's been around for a while. Pacifica has been around for a long time. Now, Mega Bloom is, is a newer cultivar of vinca. The last plant I'm going to cover for just a few minutes today is Zinnia. Zinnia, full sun to part shade. They're easily directly sown from seed. So this is kind of a common plant that we see a lot of people who are trying to teach kids how to garden. They directly sow broadcast Zinnia seeds up. They water them in, and they usually grow pretty easily. They're great as a cut flower also, depending on the ones that you get. Now, there are some that they get taller, some say shorter. I believe the one picture here was Profusion. They're not really a great cut flower because they stay really short. The Zahara series is an excellent series. The Bennery Giants is, is the taller ones, the ones that we can use for some of the, the cut flowers. They range in sizes anywhere from four inches tall, and you can get them up to three or four feet tall. Uh, I like some of the older ones because some of the older ones can get tall. Now, the zinnias are a different species, so we're not going to go into all of that. Some of the other ones that are really popular are the ones that's called zowies. And here was pictured zowies. This was in Jackson also. Um, just I like that two-tone effect on that zinnia right there. And that is pretty much all the annuals, but I wanted to kind of let you know, during these times, Extension is still working. You can go and find your Extension agent at utextension.tennessee.edu. And on the bottom right hand of the screen, you can click find your county office. So if you've got questions about plants, horticulture type questions, 4-H questions, canning and family consumer science, agriculture type questions, reach out to your extension agent, find out who that is, make a connection with them and build a relationship with them because we're free service provided and we want to help you out with any of your gardening type questions. So let me go and stop recording.